all being here. It's um, obviously very difficult circumstances right now. I hope that everyone is doing well. It looks like we have 30 people here, and I think that that is the uh, the number of people enrolled in the class. So, so that's positive in my opinion. Um, while I've been holed up, in addition to making some content for heat transfer, I've been watching some applied heat transfer videos. So uh, on YouTube, right? I'm really getting a kick out of this. Uh, Gourmet Makes videos, so this is uh, on the Bon Appetit channel, and they have a pastry chef, and she just makes, um, like in this case, she's making um, a gourmet version of Reese's Pieces, but she does a whole lot of stuff, so that's been kind of fun. Um, I've also been watching this, Binging with Babish, which is, I guess, the creator of this is from the Rochester area, so that's kind of cool, local connections, and it inspired me this weekend. Uh, I made some pizza, pizza from scratch, so this is, uh, we made the dough, we let it rest, and then we um, sort of built our own pizza here. So it was delicious. I really enjoyed it. But uh, sort of the reason that we had uh, some time, we've been sort of holed up in the house since about the middle of last week. I haven't been on campus since then uh, because, obviously, of the virus. So uh, what I wanted to talk about first was how we'll be updating our class for uh, COVID-19. So the first thing, right when we heard from the president, I sent this email out. I won't read it back to you, but this is basically just saying uh, what our plans are, including how we're going to try to deliver content like in these videos here. Um, we delayed the due date for case study number two, right? And, uh, and we eliminated, because we lost a week, we eliminated the formal review of module two as well. Although, as we'll see later, we do have two weeks of review at the end of the class. Um, there'll be no peer review component for case study two because we, I think it's just easier if, we, um, if I just move ahead and grade the case studies um, and then classes are going to start today. We'll talk a little bit about the content that's on the course later. So then I sent this email out on Friday uh, stating that we had posted the most recent version of the syllabus, so this updated version of the syllabus. I've tracked changes in this uh, updated version of the syllabus in orange. So I think the big thing here is that we've eliminated the third case study. I know that there was some feedback uh, talking about how it's difficult to work in groups when we're working remotely, potentially in different time zones and with different accessibility to the internet. So we've eliminated the third case study. Because of that, we've moved the case study grade, which is called utilization in this class, from 30% down to 20%. And we've added a 10% flexible grade component. So that flexible grade component will calculate this two different ways for every student. One as either the case study or utilization grade, and one as the final exam or comprehension grade. And then we'll take the maximum possible grade for every student. You don't have to, uh, I guess the, what the bottom of this email says is that you don't have to sort of tell us anything about what you'd like to do with your grade because we'll calculate both versions of this grade and give you the highest value. You won't have to select what you need to do. So, I mean, you're here, right? So I guess you know when our classes are going to be. We're going to try to keep to the same class schedule for these virtual versions of the class. At least for right now, we're going to try to deliver in blue jeans. I've heard some good feedback about Zoom. So if you've also been taking classes in Zoom, I'd like to hear some student feedback about that as well. But certainly for this week, we'll continue to go in blue jeans unless something uh, catastrophic happens today or Thursday. Uh, I'll also be having my office hours from 3, this should say 3.45 to 5 o'clock on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, and those will also be in blue jeans. I believe that I sent out an invite to everyone in the class for those office hours as well. So I think our responsibilities for the class are pretty close to being the same. So the first day we met, I told you that it's probably a good idea if you go over things like the slide cast and the pen casts before you get to class. Particularly, I think the slide casts are, are nice. They're maybe, you know, 15 to 20 minutes each, and they kind of cover the same information that I do in the lecture part of the class. The pen casts are more detailed notes, 
and then I also post PDFs of the of the lecture notes that I post or that I deliver in class, or at least the version from maybe a year or two ago, which is substantially the same as what we'll talk about. So these online resources are obviously going to be even more important than they were when we had a um, physical space to meet in. So if for some reason you can't attend these virtual lectures, then this material I think will uh, will serve sort of the same purpose as the as the virtual lectures are going to. We're still going to focus on trying to solve problems in these class times, right? So we can learn how to how to do the problems. But if sort of the real-time information doesn't work, I've also worked to create example problems and solutions for all the remaining content in module three. So that's 3.1, which is external convection, 3.2, which is internal convection, and 3.3, which is heat exchangers. So all of this new content is already up and live on my courses. So it includes the problem packets that will typically that I would typically distribute on Tuesdays that contain the problems we'll work on during the week. It contains caption videos, transcripts of those videos, PDF notes similar to my PDF notes that I post for the class, and handwritten solutions of the problems as well as sort of the PDF notes which are also detailed solutions to the problems. I've also uploaded the same fully captioned videos on YouTube and I'll share the links later in this presentation. So hopefully with all this online content, even if you're in a situation where you can't access in real time these lectures, you'll still be able to get all of the content that we would typically deliver in these lectures. You can access all of this content on my courses. So hopefully these are things that you've already been accessing. So for the normal sort of content we had before, you go into content, you clip, click the week that we're working on, right? So this is from the first module here. And you'll see uh, the reading from the textbooks, the slide cast, which is kind of like the same short video that I deliver, although it's delivered by Professor Rob Stevens. So maybe it's helpful to hear the same thing from two different perspectives. And then also the detailed pen cast created by Dr. Charlu, which is handwritten notes, but I think that they're sort of read aloud and captioned as, as he's writing them. Although maybe there's not separate captions because the, I, th I believe the pen is just tracing over the things that he writes, which are the same things that he says. Uh, my notes, so if you go into content outside of where all of the, oops, of where sort of the normal content is. There's this shirts or notes content. So this is PDFs of all of the lecture PDFs that I present in class. So hopefully you know those are there already, but if you don't, um, that's where they are. But then the new content, if you want it, so you'll click on content. This is only available in uh, 3.1, 2, and 3, so in the new material that we're covering. So if you click on content, and then you open this new sub-module called class problems, you'll see for all of these files, so they're named 3.2, because in this case it's section 3.2 or submodule 3.2. The first thing is the class packets. So TP stands for team problems, <laughs> or, or also the thing that you can't get in grocery stores anymore. Um, it's also 3.2 internal class problems, right? So this is the hand solution. So this is a PDF that includes the handwritten solutions of all the problems. Then there's the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint solutions. And then I've created fully captioned videos for of me sort of going through the PowerPoint solutions and talking about sort of the systematic way that I solve each problem. And then there's a transcript of that uh, fully captioned video as well. So if you'd prefer to read that, you're welcome to do that as well. So we have that for all of the class problems that we'll do for the remainder of the course. So that includes uh, three problems in external convection, which we'll learn about today, four problems in internal convection, which we'll look at next week, and four problems in heat exchangers, which we'll do the week after that. The same videos are also available uh, with the following YouTube links. So I haven't posted this uh, lec these lectures yet, the lecture that I'm delivering right now, this update, but I will. 
So you'll have uh, access to all of these YouTube links. So as I said, we've updated how your grade is being calculated in the class. So quizzes will remain the same. Uh, the homework grades all remain the same. And homework um, will be submitted and graded in the same way that it has. We dropped the third case study. So the utilization or case study grade goes from 30% down to 20%. We've left the final exam the same. And we've added this flexible grade component, which we can allocate either to utilization or to comprehension, depending on which grade is higher in your particular case. So we will calculate that for every individual student. For the remaining schedule, we lost our review week for module two. So uh, I'd encourage everyone to kind of, well, hopefully, I know it's been a stressful week, probably, uh, you know, a lot of people moving around and, and, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. But hopefully you had some time to review some heat transfer. But if you didn't, uh, we're essentially adding an, a full extra week because we don't have the case study to do in week 14. But we lost that review of module two. We'll still, uh, today we're going to start external convection. Next week we'll do internal convection. The week after that we'll learn about heat exchangers. And then in week 14 we'll have a week dedicated to review. And we can sort of determine how that looks based on class feedback. And then in week 15 we also have review for the final exam. I know people have asked about uh, how the final exam will be delivered. We're still not 100% exactly what the details will be, but we will make the exam file available on my courses for a limited time window. And we'll ask you to complete the exam in that time window. I think we're waiting for feedback. There are several classes that I believe are going to run midterms in the next week or two. So I'm interested to see what people's feedback from running those midterms is before we finalize particular details for our final exam. So the other questions that we got last week were about sort of I know that there had been a couple of emails flying back and forth about So I know there had been a couple of emails flying back and forth about the potential for a pass fail grade system. Dr. Scherzer, just a quick question. Yep. Um with that time limit, what about students who use extended time from the DSO? Yeah, so I think that we would set it up obviously we would still honor whatever accessibility requirements people have. So this is this is one of the questions that I have regarding how exams are going to be implemented. But I know when I apply deadlines to things, I can make different deadlines for different students. So I think because I know of people's accessibility requirements or you know I may also ask for feedback if you have um, accessibility requirements then we will make sure that we honor those requirements for everyone. Does that answer okay, your question? You. Yep. Um, so people had talked about this alternate grading option that's being called a pass-fail option even though it's kind of like a it's a it's a three-part system. Right, so I have here, this is the link that I've seen, so it was referenced in an email, but in the email that I got, it was not clear if this was a final policy or a policy that was being um, continuously addressed. I think that it's a final policy because it's, paste, it's uh, posted on the RIT website, uh, but if, if this changes, I'll let you know. So if you come in here, and for this class, we'd be interested in the undergraduate student policy. Right, so here this is just what this takes us to. So the first thing is that students are the people who get to choose whether or not they'll uh, use this satisfactory pass or no pass grading system. Um, for instructors, it doesn't look any different. So we'll still enter, so I'll still go to my courses. My courses will tell me a grade. In this case, I'll probably put it into Excel because I will need to calculate it multiple ways for every student. And then I'll enter a letter grade into SIS. 
Now, the registrar's office will then do some binning to see what those letter grades amount to in this satisfactory pass or no pass uh, condition, if that's been selected for a student. My understanding from this website is that there's no limit to the number of courses that a student can select this grading mechanism for, and that all that you can select it for any undergraduate course that's traditionally letter graded. Courses graded with satisfactory pass or no pass uh, will not impact term or cumulative GPA. So depending on uh, what your requirements for your GPA needs to be, there might be some um, some thinking you can do about whether or not this is the right answer for you. So this is the kind of Rosetta Stone that I've seen for satisfactory pass and no pass. So again, this is from that same website that I linked to before, um, where satisfactory uh, ranges, it looks like from A to C, pass is C minus or D, and no pass is uh, an F. So again, I think that, you know, there's some logic to decisions that can be made based on, on where you sit in the letter grade system. My understanding is that you'll see what your letter grade is and you can still elect to change to pass, or satisfactory pass, no pass after that. I think that if you're not graduating after this semester, it sounds like the option to switch in and out of this grading system will be open to you until your degree is certified. So it looks like a student may also request that the satisfactory pass, no pass option be changed back to a regular letter grade, which will then be calculated for term and cumulative GPA. And I think you have the option to do that until your degree is certified. The sort of third part of this, um, it talks about students that are repeating courses. So if you're repeating a course and you choose satisfactory pass, no pass, um, that will continue to remove the grade and GPA statistics from the previously enrolled term, but the student will not see a GPA for the course in the current term. Students who repeat a course they have failed and who select this option must pass the course in this semester in order for the failing grade to be removed from their transcript. So um, that kind of ends the update part of the lecture. So if anyone has, so, so I see a couple of questions here on the chat. So the first for Nicola, um, the satisfactory, uh, sort of the, the pass fail, website is there. Oh, it looks like someone else has answered in the chat, but I'll go to it here. So it is there. This is where I pulled all this information from. Uh, and I'll post these links. And it sounds like maybe there was an email from Message Center this morning. It may be something that I've done with my settings in Mess Message Center, but I don't seem to be getting all the emails myself. So I know that students may also be in that situation. But when I post this set of notes, which I'll do right after lecture, then you should be able to see this link there. It's also in the chat, so if you want to click on it now, you should be able to do that. Does anyone else have questions? All right, I will move from this file. to the quiz. Oops. Here, let's get this sized correctly. Sorry about this. I'm just trying to get this sized in a way where we're not crowding the interpreters there. OK, so uh, this is the latest quiz, which was about transient conduction. So the first question in the quiz is which of the following is not considered a common model in transient analysis? So our options are first term approximation, 
semi-infinite solid, stringed resistance, and lumped capacitance. Now, um, hopefully we remember, I know it now feels like a long time ago, maybe a lifetime ago that we were talking about this, um, but first term approximation, semi-infinite solid, and lumped capacitance are all transient analysis methods that we used, and stringed resistance uh, is not. Uh, it might even just be something that was made up. So the next quiz question asks us to calculate a BO number for a spaghetti noodle, and it gives us some properties, and that spaghetti noodle is exposed to a uniform convection coefficient. So we know that our definition of the BO number, sort of conceptually it talks about the resistance to conduction divided by the resistance to convection. We have an equation for that, right? And now we know all the properties. Right? It's important to remember that the characteristic length we use in these type of dimensionless numbers, we have to remember what the right characteristic length is. And for a BO number analysis, we, we're using volume over area when we're looking at the lumped capacitance type analysis. So we can uh, do some algebra here and find out that it's R divided by 2. And we get a value for the BO number or for the characteristic length. We put that back into our BO number, and we find that the BO number is listed as option C in this particular problem. Next, we're asked to calculate the thermal resistance, or the thermal time constant for, a for the same spaghetti noodle. So we know that the time constant is tau, so we have uh, alternate equations that we can use for that. So uh, we can plug some information in here and simplify the equation. We know these properties. We put them in and we find that the time constant is just about 490 seconds, which is option B in this particular problem. The next quiz question asks us which of the following is assumed about conduction in an object when using lumped capacitance. Constant properties, Spatial temperature differences exist in the object. So we know that's not true, right? So in a lumped capacitance, we assume that the temperature is the same everywhere, so that spatial temperature differences cannot exist. So we know it's not A. Steady state, no heat generation. Uniform convection. Spatial temperature differences again, so we can get rid of that one. Constant properties, no spatial temperature differences. And uniform convection, that sounds good, but let's see what D says. No spatial temperature differences in the object, constant properties, neglect radiation, and non-uniform convection. So we know that we can't use lumped, convection, lumped capacitance if the convection coefficient is not uniform. So in this case, the answer is C. Our next quiz question asks us how long it will take an object whose temperature changes uniformly over time to cool down from 20 degrees to 5 degrees when the ambient temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. We're given a time constant. So here we can use this equation, right? We know our initial conditions. We put that in and we find C1. So we have an equation for how temperature changes or the temperature difference changes over time. And now we can go in and we can solve for T. We have to remember to multiply both sides by the natural log. And then we can find that the temperature is about 14 minutes. So 14 minutes is in our answer. It's answer E. I guess the tricky thing here is that I kept the time constant as 10 instead of converting that into seconds. So I kept the time constant in minutes, which means that because my exponent here is a dimensionless number that when I'm solving for t, t will also be in minutes. So if I convert it to seconds, then I would get uh, 14 times 60, and I'd have to remember my answer was in seconds. So does anyone have any questions about the quiz? This is the quiz that was due a couple of weeks ago, right? Not the one that was due last night. Is it? I thought that this was the quiz that was due last night. Because this is the last material that we covered in class. Maybe I went over the wrong quiz.
technology. Yeah, that doesn't... Oh, then I did the wrong quiz last night. All right. Okay, if you feel like you did the wrong quiz, um, let me know. I'll double check uh, after class, but you can always send me an email and we can sort of figure out how to how to solve that issue. Okay. Um, so Marcus has a question. Yep. For the BO number, for number two, just to review, um, for the BI number, I guess I was struggling with um, LBI related to volume over area. So in that problem, because... Just for the plate. So does that mean we have to double it or not? Because that's the part that I was confused on. Sorry, let sense. me... Uh... go back here so the quiz review this one right so here we have the yes yeah, so we have to double the area because um, this is the but this is a spaghetti noodle right so it's not a plate is this the right question that you were talking right, about so double the area yeah it's the right question but um, so if it's a plate so the area of the it's, it's not a wall, it's a plate. So then you have to double the area. Or no, so it's not a plate. A uh, spaghetti noodle is like a big cylinder. So the area here is the perimeter, which is two pi r, or pi d if you prefer, times the length of the spaghetti noodle. And the volume is going to be the area, the cross-sectional area. Oops which is pi r squared multiplied by the length of the of the noodle. Okay, so that means that the volume is s stable, you don't have to like double or triple the volume or anything. Nope. So the, the, okay. the so the volume of the noodle is the cross-sectional area multiplied by the length. Right, and in this case, do they give? Oh, they do give us the length, okay. but we could still solve this problem if they didn't give us the length, because both the volume and the area are proportional to the length, so the lengths actually drop out. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. I got it. Okay, are there any other questions about? Sorry to bring this up again, but I just like went back into my courses to check the quiz yep. and the first question on the quiz that was due on Sunday night had to do with the semi-infinite solid transient model. Okay, so it looks like I went over the wrong quiz. Maybe uh, maybe on Thursday I can go over the right quiz then because it looks like I picked the wrong one. Uh, all right. Sorry about that. Is <laughs> that a couple questions on this last quiz? Okay, well, here, we can try to do this in real time. Let me... <laughs> no, we can wait till Thursday. Okay, I th thank you. <laughs> I, I started sweating sure over here. You can't see me. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so we'll do new material now. Sorry about that. So, Which makes sense, right? Because I think those were all um, lump capacitance type questions, right? So I think that I did the wrong one. That makes sense. But this is the right content, I promise, this next part. So we've been talking about heat transfer for a little while now, right? And whenever we talk about convection, we're basically told what the convection heat transfer coefficient is. So what we're going to do in this next module is learn how to find the heat transfer convection coefficient. Because it turns out it's pretty important, right? So if you were doing your case study on the fire safe, you probably found that the behavior of the safe is significantly different depending on the convection coefficient in the problem. So just a, re a reminder or a refresher about what convection is. So we get convection heat transfer when we transfer thermal energy between a solid and a fluid or between a fluid and a solid. We define convection heat transfer by this equation 
that Q is equal to HA times delta T. But up until this point, we've generally been doing problems where they'll maybe tell us what H is, or maybe we have to find H if we have Q, A, and delta T. But we don't know how to get it almost from first principles, or we don't know how to find H if we don't know everything else in this equation. So I think before we, we do this, we can look at how um, fluids transfer heat, right? And maybe even before we look at fluids, we can think about how solids transfer heat. So if I have something that looks like a plate or a rod of aluminum, and I'm adding heat to it, what happens is I have all these aluminum molecules, right? And as they get hotter, they start to vibrate more, right? Or they get um, an increased velocity of this Brownian motion or this kind of random motion that they have. But they're still sort of bound in the same place. They're vibrating around the same point. But as time increases, what happens is you know, those, those molecules start to bump into each other, right? And that sort of transfers this energy throughout this solid, right? And we call that diffusion of heat. So that's this transfer of heat in, in sort of a conducting fluid, and that conduction happens because of the vibration of these molecules, right? So that, that's what happens in conduction, Right, is that we get this diffusion of heat because of this Brownian motion of molecules inside our conducting material. So now we still want to think about how fluids transfer heat, but we know that um, heat transfer and mass transfer are analogous. They're kind of very similar. The equations are the same, uh, just we have different parameters in the equations. So we know that, that fluids can move by diffusion. Right? So if you put uh, a little bit of food coloring into, into your glass of water, you'll see that diffusion happen. Or you can't see me right now, but I'm drinking tea. And when I was steeping my tea, um, there's diffusion inside the fluid. But fluids also move by what's called advection. Right? So this is, um, this is kind of a computational fluid dynamics model of flow over a cylindrical pillar. And it kind of has this beautiful vortex pattern, right? So when you think about flu fluid moving by advection, we can think about um, a fluid element that's traveling in a stream. And because this, the fluid in the stream has a particular velocity, the, the, the molecules in that fluid element are diffusing, but they're also kind of moving with the flow. So advection is movement with the flow. Now, when we talk about convection, it's this combination of diffusion and advection, right? So that's what convection is, is that um, things are moving both by diffusion and by advection. And the relative importance of these two things might be different in different cases. So maybe when you were looking up heat transfer coefficients for your second case study, you may have found some heat transfer coefficients for natural convection where the flow velocity is low, right? So basically it's just buoyancy that's driving a flow. So the air around my face is a little hotter than the air in the rest of the room. So its density is a little bit less. So it has a tendency to move up. So there is some motion of the fluid, but diffusion is more important in those cases because the velocity of the fluid is fairly slow. But in other cases, when we have forced convection and fluid is moving very quickly, then the advection becomes more important, right? So that's why H changes a lot. It kind of tells us um, in some part what the relative importance of diffusion and advection are. So fluids transfer heat in the same way that they transfer mass. So heat can diffuse in a fluid. So the same kind of Brownian motion and molecules bumping into each other. But it, he can also be advected in a fluid because if I just have some hot temperature and it's moving through some hot temperature fluid that's moving through some cold temperature fluid, there will be heat transfer just because I'm physically moving that hot fluid, right? And again, this com the combination of these two things is called convection. So we have convection heat transfer as well as convection mass transfer. So we have this Newton's law of cooling, 
right? And I think our big problem as engineers is that it's it's great that we have this equation. We know that it that it works reasonably well to describe the universe, at least when we're talking about convective convective heat transfer. But in a lot of real practical applications, we don't know how to find H, right? Or or we'd really like to know how to find H. Right? So it turns out that we can use a little bit of math and a little bit of engineering intuition to try to figure out how to find this heat transfer coefficient. So what I show here, right, so we're going to try to do a first law on the problem. So I've drawn, or at least I took a sketch from the textbook that shows two different things. So the sketch on the top here, you might be kind of familiar with from fluid mechanics, right? We have some free stream velocity and the fluid is moving over the plate and you get this velocity boundary layer, right? Or this kinematic boundary layer. So here, um, I don't know if you remember from fluids or if you talked about it in your fluids class, that the fluid elements right at the wall, we assume they don't move. We call that the no slip boundary condition, that the velocity of the fluid at the wall actually has the same velocity of the wall. And if the wall's not moving, then the velocity is zero. But we also, did you, did you talk at all about boundary layers in fluid mechanics? Maybe someone can answer in the chat or, or through their audio. Oh, good. So, so this isn't totally brand new, but just like there's a fluid boundary layer or a hydrodynamic boundary layer, there's also a thermal boundary layer, right? So we have temperature that's moving over a plate and it has a particular temperature, right? There's a temperature at the free stream, but there's also a temperature at the plate. And what happens is that just beca you know, because of that no slip condition, we typically assume that the fluid that's at the plate has a temperature of the plate. And then there's this thermal boundary layer where the temperature changes, right? So this thermal boundary layer is the height of the fluid where you get this temperature gradient until you get back to the free stream temperature, right? And the, the thickness of the thermal boundary layer doesn't have to be the same thickness as the velocity boundary layer. So if we think about this, we can draw a control surface in this no slip region. So our control surface is essentially right at the surface of the plate, right? But we're thinking about the fluid on both sides, right? So if we think about there's conduction into the flu into our control surface because the it's conduction through the fluid, but if the fluid's not moving, then it doesn't have that advection part, so we can model it like a solid. And then there's convection out on the other side of our surface because that's where the fluid is moving. And we can write an equation similar to what we might have done for conduction. So we know here that we have conduction on the left-hand side and convection on the right-hand side. We can go through and we can get an equation for H. Right? So here's our heat transfer coefficient. It's going to be the uh, conductivity, the thermal conductivity of the fluid multiplied by the temperature gradient in the fluid at the plate, so right at the surface, and that's divided by our temperature difference between the, the surface and the free stream. Right? And this would be great to find H if we actually knew what the temperature gradient at the surface was. And it's actually fairly difficult to get this you can um you can design an experiment where maybe you have um a hot wire anemometer or something that can measure your your temperature or your fluid and and you sort of move that right up to the surface but every time you do that when you do an experiment you're also sort of changing the system right so we don't usually know the temperature in the fluid as a function of y so this uh, won't turn out to be a calculus problem where we can just take the derivative of our temperature profile because we usually don't have the temperature profile. Right? Because to get this, we'd have to simultaneously solve the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So it's, it's actually kind of a difficult thing to do that. Right? And it's, it's sort of ultimately because we don't have something like a grand unified theory of physics, right? So we, we can't describe everything from first principles. And that's kind of a real difficulty that a lot of engineers face 
in real applications because you know we'd like to be able to just derive everything and then we would have really good models right but in real life sometimes our need to find an answer to a problem outstrips our fundamental understanding of the physics so what we do as engineers is we try to solve problems with imperfect inf information so we're going to try to use our intuition so here i've drawn or at least i took from the textbook a sketch of the thermal boundary layer right so i know that h is proportional to the gradient of the temperature at the plate so i can think about h as it moves down the plate i know that my thermal boundary layer is going to keep getting bigger until it eventually becomes fully developed maybe you remember that from from fluid mechanics but eventually the thickness of my boundary layer will no, no longer be a function of x so here what happens is because over here right where the where the boundary layer is thinner i have to get the same temperature difference over a smaller distance right whereas over here i get the same temperature difference over a larger difference so i can assume that my um my slope right dt by dy increases when the boundary layer gets thinner right so it's it should be sort of highest at the leading edge of the plate and it should get smaller as we move along so i would expect h to decrease as we move along the plate so this tells me that h is a function of x and that i would expect h to decrease as we move down the plate so you might be remembering from uh, fluid mechanics that eventually as this flow moves down the plate it's going to become turbulent or at least it could become turbulent right and turbulence we don't necessarily like turbulence when we have to do the math because the math is extremely difficult because there's this kind of um, stochastic or random part of turbulence. But in practical applications, engineers tend to like turbulence because it gives us much better mixing. So what happens as we move down the plate, you can see the flow is becoming sort of chaotic far away from the plate. So that mixing in the vortices what they do is they they make the temperature in that region and the velocity in that region more uniform <coughs> so what that means is when we go into turbulence we we sort of shrink the height where we see the temperature difference so what happens in turbulence is that we would expect better mixing and that the temperature change or the gradient of temperature at the surface of the plate would go up because now we need to when we first trip into turbulence we need to get that same temperature difference from the plate to the free stream but it happens over a smaller distance than it would for a laminar flow so we would expect then that the heat transfer coefficient um, sort of has this almost like step up when we transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow so this is what a sketch of the heat transfer coefficient might look like. So here, uh, there's no units here, right? But as we move down the plate with x, right, in the laminar region, we get that x, or that he, the heat transfer coefficient is decreasing. But then we trip to turbulence, so we get kind of this step up as we go through the transition region. And then again, once we become turbulent, as we move down, as long as that boundary layer keeps thickening, then we would expect h to keep going down so we know that h is a function of x which means that when we're talking about plates we can be talking about either a local heat transfer coefficient which might be interested which you might be interested in if you want to know maybe the temperature difference at a particular plate a place on your plate but you might also be interested in an average heat transfer coefficient which means we'd have to sort of have a an equation for h and maybe integrate right so the average heat transfer coefficient um, would be the the integral of h over the area so what we're forced to do as engineers is estimate h because we don't have this at least in most problems we don't know uh, the function of temperature as a function of y so we don't know the the profile of the temperature in the fluid 
So we can sort of start to look at this just like we did before when we were talking about BO numbers. We can look at this problem and say, well, the heat transfer coefficient is a function of a whole lot of things, right? Like the position on the plate, the free stream velocity, the geometry of the problem, whatever boundary conditions I have on the plate. Maybe my plate is constant temperature or constant heat flux. Uh, the temperature of the surface, the temperature in the free stream, the fluid properties, right? So there's a lot of things that might be important for this problem, right? And just like when we talked about last time, right? We like to take problems as engineers that are complicated and simplify them. So we want to try to collapse this list from all of these different parameters down to a smaller number of parameters. And the way that we do that as engineers is we like to um, sort of try to develop some dimensionless parameters, right? And hopefully our dimensionless parameters have some kind of a physical meaning. So here, we talked last time about kind of using something like a Buckingham Pi theory. We look at the uh, variables we have and we try to construct some um, dimensionless parameters. So the first one, you know, you might look at this list and see, well, I know that when I was in fluid mechanics for a problem like this, I would talk about the Reynolds number, right? And the Reynolds number tells me um, the ratio or, or basically how important viscous forces in the flow are versus um, sort of the kinetics of the problem, right? So, so how important is the momentum of the fluid versus the viscosity? Right, so I can do that. That sort of helps me start to collapse the problems, inertial forces versus viscous forces, right? So as the uh, Reynolds number gets bigger, right, that means inertial forces start to win, and eventually you trip into tur turbulence because those inertial forces um, almost start to cause those fluid elements to spin because the, the one closer to the wall is moving so slow that it turns in on itself, right? So now we can start to look at some other parameters, right? And we're going to come up with a new dimensionless parameter that you probably are unfamiliar with called the Prandtl number, right, or PR. So the Prandtl number tells us something about momentum diffusivity versus thermal diffusivity, right? What that means, right, so this is like the diffusion of velocity and the diffusion of heat. So essentially what this does is it gives us an an idea of the relative size of the thermal boundary layer versus the velocity boundary layer, right? So, so the momentum part, that tells us something about the velocity boundary layer, and the thermal part tells us something about the temperature boundary layer. We're also going to talk about another dimensionless parameter called the Nusselt number. So the Nusselt number is like a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. So Nuzzle number is a function of at least the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, and the position on the plate. Right? So we can talk about average Nuzzle numbers and local Nuzzle numbers, right? So average would be NU bar, and the local number would be NU sub X, right? And these will both be related to um, sort of respectively the local heat transfer coefficient and the average heat transfer coefficient. So the Nusselt number is given by the coefficient of <laughs> by the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by some characteristic dimension divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid. Right? So in this case, um, when we're talking about a local Nusselt number, then if we're talking about flow over a plate, then the characteristic dimension is the position on the plate from the leading edge. So the distance from the leading edge to the position I'm interested in. And if I'm talking about an average Nusselt number for flow over a plate, then my characteristic dimension in orange here is the total length of the plate. So this looks a little bit like the BO number, right? Because it's a convection coefficient multiplied by a distance divided by what looks like um, thermal conductivity, but it's conductivity of the fluid, right? So here, uh, the characteristic dimension is different right, because it's the length of the surface, right, whereas in the BO number, it was more about the thickness of the material. Um, and now the conductivity coefficient that we're talking about is for the fluid and not for a solid. 
So even though the, the variables look the same, it kind of has a different physical meaning, right? So this is the ratio of convection to conduction inside the fluid. So it's sort of telling us a little bit, um, well, it's basically, so it's a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. So if I know the Nusselt number and I know the characteristic dimension in Kf, then I can solve for H. The problem is, when I've done this, I didn't collapse all the variables. So there's still a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't account for, right? And that's because we don't have a perfect understanding of how this looks, uh, how the physics works. So what we need to do is, or what experimentalists do, is they calculate Reynolds or Nussel numbers for different conditions. So we need to know something about the geometry of the problem. So in this case, what I'm showing here is um, flow over a flat plate, right? And in this case, the boundary condition, the plate is isothermal. Our Nusselt number will often have uh, the shape. So we call this the Nusselt number correlation. <coughs> so for different cases, we'll have different equations or correlations. Um, and it usually has the form of some constant times the Reynolds number to some exponent, m, times the Prandtl number to some exponent n. So for this case, flow over a flat plate that's isothermal, when I'm in the laminar region, I can use this equation here for the local Nusselt number. And then because I have the correlation, and I know the definition of the local Nusselt number, I can set these two things equal to each other, and then I could solve for hx, the local heat transfer coefficient. Right, so I can do that here, right? And then if I know uh, the fluid properties and the Reynolds number, then, then I can sort of solve this equation. And there's different, I mean, we can do some algebra here, right? So, so this is basically just, um, instead of having the Reynolds number like it was here, we sort of use the definition of Reynolds number there, but this is the same equation. So here we see, uh, we, we did that to kind of get an idea of what, uh, the term of x looks like and even though uh, right so we're kind of using intuition and we feel like the heat transfer coefficient should be decreasing as x increases right and that's what we see in this equation that x is in the denominator <coughs> if i'm looking for the average nussel number which more often than not we would be looking for the average number to get sort of the total heat transfer between the plate and the free stream then we would use this equation provided that the flow was laminar for the whole plate. If I was in the turbulent region, shown in purple, then I have uh, different Nusselt number correlations. So again, I have a Nusselt number correlation uh, for a local position, which is then based on a local Reynolds number. Or I have an average Nusselt number correlation, which is also given here. These equations are reasonable as long as the Prandtl number is larger than 0 0.6. Now, I'll need different equations if my boundary conditions are different, right? Because then the geometry and boundary conditions change. So if I have flow over a plate with constant heat flux, then in the laminar region, I have Nusselt number correlations that look like this, so they're different. And then if I had the average Nusselt number, then I could find the total heat transfer from the plate to the free stream, right? Which I could have done in the previous question as well, <coughs> or on the previous slide, I'm sorry. If it's turbulent, then I pick different correlations. So this is kind of the, the process that we'll have to go through, is that we'll have to look at, for every problem, we have to classify what the geometry and the boundary conditions are, and then we'll look to find the Nusselt number, and then when we find the Nusselt number, we can find the heat transfer coefficient, right? And that's what I tried to lay out here. And in all the convection problems, if you look at my notes and the videos that I made, I'll always go through this process, right? So this is our convection flow chart. If we're trying to find H, this is the process we'll follow. So the first thing we want to do is understand the geometry and the boundary conditions, right? So we do this because we have these different correlations and experimentalists are finding different correlations depending on the geometry and the boundary conditions. 
Now, you might have found this in some of your case studies before, is that we can't really let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We have to pick a, a correlation that fits best in our problem, even though it's not perfect. Like, it's probably not true that a plate will be perfectly uniform in temperature. But if it doesn't have constant heat flux, and we're trying to keep the temperature constant, then we can still apply that boundary condition. After we know the geometry, we'll find relative properties of the fluid at an appropriate temperature. For external convection, the temperature we'll find the properties at is the temperature of the film, right? So this is the average temperature over the boundary layer. So it's T infinity, or the temperature of the free stream, plus T of the surface divided by two. After we have all those properties, then we can find the Reynolds number. Because it's important to know whether or not the flow is turbulent or laminar, because the heat transfer performance will be very different. So we find the Reynolds number to figure out if the problem is laminar or turbulent. Then, once we know all of that, then we can go back and try to find the Nusselt number correlation that's the right correlation to help us find the convection. Finally, then, once we have the Nusselt number, we can find H, right? And once we know the heat transfer coefficient, then we can treat whatever problem we're asked kind of like a problem we saw in Module 1, where they just gave us the heat transfer coefficient. Right? So once we have H, then we can solve the problem, right? So I think if we try to... I mean, maybe it's just because I'm not good at memorizing things, but the way that I try to solve problems is to classify them into different types and then kind of have a flow chart or a process like this. And I think if I do that, then um, then I don't, you know, then I'll be able to, to solve any kind of a problem, right? So um, there's a question in the chat, uh, where did the exponents come from? So I assume that that question is about the exponents in the correlations. So here, uh, in Reynolds number and Prandtl number, I don't know if Jonathan can respond. Okay, so what happens is experimentalists run through a whole bunch of different cases that have different Reynolds numbers and different Prandtl numbers, and they just fit a curve experimentally. So, uh, you know, when I talk about there not being a grand unified theory, there's no real physical reason why the exponents are what they are. So these just come from experimental correlation. Basically, people plotted them on a graph, and if you plot a log plot, then, then you can try to fit a straight line to that log plot, and that'll give you the exponent. So it's, um, you know, there's kind of no magic to it. So these are just, and, and what happens is, so we'll talk about a couple Nusselt number correlations, but in real life, um, people do this for lots and lots of different cases that are super, you know, that can be super granule granular so um you know you have to try to find a correlation that works right or that's reasonable but you know if you're going to fly you know if you're designing an airplane wing or something you do this initially but eventually you probably want to build a prototype and test it right so then we have this flow chart right now for external flow we can use this same process um for things that are not just flow over a plate so we can do this for flow over a cylinder, right? So this flow, again, is kind of a very beautiful flow. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm biased, right? But it's interesting because when flow moves over this cylinder, um, there's part of the region is laminar at the front of the cylinder here, but then it, you know, you get sort of turbulence and, and sort of separation from the, from the cylinder, right? So here, when we're calculating Reynolds number, we have a different definition from Reynolds number. Here, it depends on the diameter of the cylinder. And then we can have different Nusselt number correlations. So this is one that the textbook talks about, but it's kind of a little bit rough to put this into your calculator. So, uh, you know, I think what happens is as the complexity of these Nusselt numbers goes up, they're probably more accurate in a particular window but I would probably try my best not to, not to use this correlation because it's a little bit ugly, especially if I'm writing an exam or something. So typically, for cylindrical pillars, 
I'll try to use this Nusselt number correlation, which again is kind of in this um, form of a constant times a Reynolds number to some power times a Prandtl number to some other power, right? So in this case, the Prandtl number is always to the power of one third, but then depending on what your Reynolds number is, right? So if you have different Reynolds numbers, then you can find C and M on this table 7.2, and then you plug them in over here, and that'll help you find the Nusselt number. And then once you know Nusselt number, you can solve for H. For flow over cylinders like this, we're always talking about local Nusselt numbers, or at least in these two correlations that I showed. Um, we're not talking about the, or sorry, average Nusselt numbers. We're not talking about local Nusselt numbers at particular azimuthal positions. We can uh, generalize this same process for pillars that are non-cylindrical, right? So uh, here on table 7.3, there's a bunch of different shapes. They're telling us what the characteristic length here, D, should be in these cases, right? So sometimes, like if we look at the hexagons, there's two different hexagons and two different squares. So we got to think about how the flow is sort of attacking the shape, right? Because that'll give us um, different ways to find C and M. So here again, so we'd find the Reynolds number based on D in this problem, where D is given in this table. And then once we know the Reynolds number in these types of cases, we can again pick off C and M from the table and plug those into our Nusselt number correlation. So we can do this for, um, for flat plates, right? So flow is moving over a flat plate, flow is moving over a cylindrical pillar, or flow is moving over a cylinder or, or pillar of some other shape, right? And we call this... Uh, external flow, meaning it's it's not flow inside of a channel or a pipe. So next week we'll talk more about flows inside channels and pipes, um, which we call internal flow. And we'll talk about what the difference is a little more next week. So that was the end of the lecture material that I wanted to present today. Um, we do have some time left. Um, if people have questions, so again, I'm, I'm happy to field questions either in the chat or if you want to unmute your audio. <coughs> so I think we probably don't have enough time uh, to work through a problem today, but you're welcome to start working on problems. So um, I know you have your homework problems, but before you do that, it might be worthwhile to kind of, you know, either attempt the team problems or the class problems or watch the videos to kind of see the process. I think when we're dealing in convection, external and internal, we, you know, if we just follow that flow chart, if we follow the process, then I think you'll end up with, uh, with good answers more often than not. So if there aren't any questions, I'll, you know, I'll give you a couple seconds here. But if not, there's nothing else that I wanted to talk about today. Questions are welcome to be about the course, uh, about the material today, or about sort of RIT things in general. Again, I may not know the answer to some of these things, but I'm happy to, to sort of try to answer any. Okay, if there are no questions, um, you're free to go. I just hope that everybody's everybody's doing well. I'm I'm encouraged by the attendance that we have today. I hope that's uh, some kind of a signal that that people are doing doing fairly well. Um, I understand that that there can be uh, you know some hardships that are associated with what's going on. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why the university has implemented this pass fail system. But if there's anything specific that you'd like to talk to me about. Um, you know, regarding the course and, and what's going on, we'll certainly do our best to try to make sure that, uh, that everybody still has a, a good experience in this class. Thank you, everyone.
Professor, for the team homework problems, um, do we need to write them out to be able to get a grade? Sorry, I, I just blew my nose. I missed I missed the question. I'm sorry. For the team homework problems? For the team. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, for the team problems? Oh, so um, the, the problem sheets are given on the website. So if we go to... them up so you just want we load so if you go into the content here we go um, so for each week at the top there'll be something that looks like this so in this case it would be 3.1 external convection uh, probably TP after that or it could be CP so those if you if you download that PDF that's going to be the same question sheet that I would usually hand out in class. So that's the description of the problem. And then over here, this will be um, basically on that same sheet, handwritten solutions. So this is probably similar to the handwritten solutions that we see for homework problems. But then for each problem, um, I've also put up uh, a power PDF of the PowerPoints that I did. So here is an example of the first one. So what happens in this case is that uh, always the beginning of the problem talks about sort of the problem statement. So this is taken sort of from the, the problem statement on that handout. So you'll see it if you go to the videos, but um, but they're also posted separately because you may want to see it outside of the video. So either in the notes or... Um, so in all of those things, the problem statement is there. But if you're looking for sort of a package that would be the same package that I distribute at the beginning of classes, then this is that. Uh, or that's available on the website. I do also want to stress that I, I called them team problems. I think that's nomenclature from or the words that people are using from uh, previous iterations of the class, where on the Thursday classes, people would work in teams on these problems instead of us all working together on the board. So these are not, I just want to be clear that you don't have to write out the solutions for these. It's nice to learn, right? But, but this is nothing that would be due or submitted or anything. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, that was just a question I wanted to clarify just to make sure. So. Okay. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.